Welcome, everyone. This is a great crowd, lots of new faces. I'd like to read you a little about Linda while we're still fumbling with chairs. Linda Fowler is Professor of Government and Frank J. Reagan Chair in Policy Studies Emerita at Dartmouth College, where she continues to lecture and conduct research. She directed Dartmouth's Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Social Sciences from 1995 to 2004. Previously, she was professor of political science in the Maxwell School at Syracuse University. She holds her BA from Smith College. I bet you might know some of the people I know. <laughs> and, her MA, <laughs> and her MA and PhD from the University of Rochester. She specializes in American politics and has been a frequent commentator in various media outlets. She's published three books on Congress, Political Ambition, Who Decides to Run for Congress, Yale 1993, Watch Dogs on the Hill, The Decline of Congressional Oversight of U.S. Foreign Relations, Princeton 2015, and scores of articles, books, chapters, and op-eds on such topics as interest groups, women in politics, veto-proof majorities, and presidential primaries. I think I skipped one. Um, who did, oh, Candidates Congress and the American Democracy. That was in Michigan, 1993. She is currently writing about who testifies at congressional committees and partisan gerrymandering. Fowler received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2005 to 2006 and multiple awards for her research and undergraduate teaching at Syracuse and Dartmouth. Prior to obtaining her PhD, she worked at the Environmental Protection Agency and for a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Please give a warm welcome to Linda Fowler. Well, because I'm still active as a scholar and lecturer, a lot of people come up to me and say, tell me things aren't as bad as they seem to me. <laughs> and I would guess that from the size of this crowd today, which I understand is unusual, that there are many people of the same fears here in Burlington as there are in Hanover. Um, and I did this talk, a, sim a similar talk, not the same talk, to a Dartmouth Club group in Iowa, um, and it seemed to me to be pertinent to a, a wide range of, of people. So I asked Cindy if this talk would suit her, and she said yes. So before I get started, I think it's important to, for you to know two things about me. The first is that the last eight years have been a profound professional challenge. In every way, I've spent 50 years of my life studying American politics. I thought I knew quite a lot about it. And judging from the awards I received when I taught about it or wrote about it, I thought, yeah, you know, you've got this. And um, obviously, I don't. And so much of what I'm doing now with public lectures is trying to figure out what I missed, why I missed it, what's different, and what do I think about it? And um, so, and it's been a particular challenge because of um, the situation in the Republican Party. Because we've never really seen a contemporary political party dissolve before our eyes, which is what I think we're seeing. And I felt it is, so it's important to me since I have a reputation for being, on the one hand, on the other hand, kind of person, thinking to positive things to say about one side and positive things to the other side. And it's been difficult <laughs> to try to convey that because there really is an asymmetry in, in my perception. And most political scientists share that perception. And we have actually a lot of empirical evidence based on roll call voting that confirms it. So what do you say when you come into a room like this? You don't know how many Republicans there are. You don't know how many Democrats there are. And so what I've decided, I will not mention any five-letter word. I will not mention Trump, and I will not mention Biden. 
So what you have to do is, what I decided to do is, what's happening in American politics isn't just about two old men. It's not just about the fact that Congress is completely dysfunctional, uh, both chambers really, um, that because the Congress can't do what it's supposed to do constitutionally, we have a Supreme Court that is pushing all the boundaries of legitimacy, and a president who's routinely being asked whether it was Trump in, oh, there it is, whether <laughs> it was the other guy um, or this guy um, being pushed by Congress and by the public to do things that are outside their legitimate authority. That's what happens when Congress can't do its job. So my dilemma, how do I avoid antagonizing the audience um, and by not mentioning those five letter words? And more importantly, how do I start focusing people's attention on the broader picture of why we're in this situation. So that's what I'm going to do today. And to do it, I'm going to take you back to the 1830s. <laughs> I don't think any of us was alive then. <laughs> but um, I taught an Osher course um, and, uh, in the fall. And Osher is like EEE. Uh, ex and um, it was on perspectives from Tocqueville's democracy in America and their relevance for today. So, so you now know kind of where I'm coming from and what I want to do. It's not that I'm chicken to take on these two five-letter words, um, but I just think what's really important for the public now is to get out of the horse race, which is dominating the press, out of the coverage of personalities, which is dominating the press, out of the alarmist rhetoric on both sides um, and to try to focus our attention on this bigger issue. So I'm going to start with a puzzle. And um, we're going to put the Statue of Liberty up here now. <laughs> this really sells it, sells it, it says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, we have this democracy. And we don't know what to do with it. Because democracy is always messy, and it's particularly messy right now. So a lot of young people particularly are saying democracy isn't working, it's not working for them. Other people are saying we want a strong leader who will fix everything. Other people are saying, you know, we want anarchy. Other people are, you know, so people are all over the map about this. But the puzzle is when you look objectively at the data. So let's take a, an example of the Weimar Republic in 1939. What was the inflation rate in the Weimar Republic? About 250,000. You needed wagons to go around if you were going to buy anything in the Weimar Republic. What else had happened to the Germans in the Weimar Republic in the 1930s? This is before the the Beer Hall puts. They had lost a war. They had lost a huge number of their young men, as had everybody in, in that war. And they were saddled with reparations. They were bankrupt. Their country was a wreck economically. So you could sort of say, I'm not excusing what happened in Germany after that, but you could sort of look and see why the Germans said democracy isn't going to work for us. It's also the case that the Democrats, small d, in the Weimar Republic couldn't agree among themselves. So they made the government very vulnerable. All right, well, let's fast forward to 2024. What do we see? By every objective measure, the country is in pretty darn good shape. Think about it. I'm just going to look at my list here. Record high stock market, record low unemployment. And we're not talking about record low in the last 10 years. We're talking about last 60 years. High GDP growth in the last quarter of 5%. Mature economies don't get that kind of, but we did. Um, increases in real wages. And where, they where it counts, 
I'm sorry, I have a familial tremors and sometimes it, they act up, which is what they're doing right now. Um, the increase in real wages, and for the first time in a long time, the wage growth has been in the lower middle and middle. The wealthy did pretty well too, but we have had decades now of increasing income inequality because wages in the lower half were just not increasing. We have declines in the overall crime rate. That might come as a surprise to you because what do we hear in the press all the time? Crime, 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 crime. Even violent crimes are down, particularly in cities in blue states. Um, reductions in the inflation rate, which is now within the Fed target. For the first time in 20 years, the nation is not actively engaged in war. Now, we all wish the Afghan withdrawal had proceeded in a different way, but the fact remains that Trump had negotiated an agreement with the Taliban, and Biden had to execute it because we didn't have enough troops there to do something else, and it was horrible. Nevertheless, it's done. Um, for the, and the U.S. came out of the pandemic in the best shape of any of the G7 of the major democracies. Um, and finally, um, you have young people for the first time actually making economic gains. You have the lowest unemployment rate among black voters. You have a lot of good stuff. This is not the Weimar Republic. There's no reason for people to be as angry and as aggrieved by any objective measure. This is not the Great Depression. This isn't even the stagflation that we had um, under Nixon and Jimmy Carter when people were pretty angry. So the question then, the puzzle I have for you is, if the current situation is relatively good, why do Americans feel so bad? And there are a lot of reasons for that um, that I'll talk about briefly. But to me, one of the things that, that my course that I taught in Tocqueville pointed me to two things that are very problematic with our democracy and that I think are responsible for why we feel so bad. The first is the loss of the art of association. And the understanding that Tocqueville pointed, and I'll give you more about this in a minute, that what was unique about the American democracy was that people had learned to cooperate. They had to cooperate because there were no nobles, there were no great barons, there were you know, no popes, no anybody to sort of organize activity. So they had to figure out that they had to do it together. And the second is the um, principle of what he called self-interest rightly understood, uh, which means people understanding that their own well-being is connected to the well-being of others. So these are two really simple ideas, and they were the things that when Tocqueville got done with his two volumes and 700 pages, that were the things that were distinctive about the American democracy that accounted for the reason why ours was thriving in 1830. And the French had had this horrible mess and had reverted to empire by the 1830s. Okay, so that's where we're gonna go. And, but let me just sort of suggest to you, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is evidence from public opinion that's cause for alarm. You know, we're not making this up. We're not just all paranoid and crazy about what we're seeing. Evidence about public opinion that's cause for optimism. Alternative explanations for why the country is in a funk. And Tocqueville's arguments about the art of association and self-interest. And then I've told Cindy, I've left quite a lot of time for us to talk about this. You know, to sort of see whether, how, how you feel about this analysis and what you might want to contribute to it uh, and so forth. So, let's start by um, talking about public opinion. And there are many more things I could have added to this list. Nearly three out of four Americans say the country is on the wrong track. 
they actually, this is something we all agree about. <laughs> we just don't agree who's responsible or how to fix it. 60% see the opposite party as a threat to the nation. Cynicism about politicians and, uh, is incredibly low. Could you give me um, a slide? So here we go. I went into politics because there isn't any money in honest work. Um, and um, next one, please. And here's an average of trust. This is a long historical time series among pollsters, and, it's, and this is, comes from Pew. This is the percent of people who say they trust the government to do what is right just about always or most of the time. Here's where it was when Dwight Eisenhower's period. And of course that makes sense. The country had just come off of vic made an incredible victory in war and the economy with, was booming and so forth. It starts to go down with Nixon, not surprisingly. But then it stays down with these really nice guys, Ford and Carter, Reagan, the sunny optimist, Bush, Clinton, uh-oh, W. Bush, what do you think this peak is? 9-11. And <laughs> here's Barack Obama. Um, here's Trump. And here's Biden. So reading across the title here, less than 20%, give or take a few percentages for Trump and Biden. And so there's an argument among scholars Okay, it's the 50s that were the anomaly. This is much more typical of what we would expect to see in a democracy. But nevertheless, the fact that it, we have had some peaks um, under H, uh, W. Bush and, um, and George Bush because of 9-11, um, but gee, that's a heck of a way to earn trust in government. Um, a terrorist attack where the president um, didn't pay attention to the intelligence until the planes hit the towers. Not a real good way to earn your tru earn trust, but it, because it was a crisis, we all came together and, and Bush enjoyed an incredible run of sky-high approvals right after that. So at any rate, 85% um, that made, say that major change or complete reform is needed. 49% say demo American democracy is not working well. Near record low approvals of Congress, the President, and the big one, the Supreme Court. In the past, the Supreme Court has been able to ride out the storms that have brought down trust in the presidency and the Congress, but not this time. And um, so that should be a serious cause for concern in the court right now. Um, and near record, okay, 30% don't believe in democracy. I've never seen that number. Never seen it in all my years of teaching. Um, and 70% um, think that the worry about growing extremism in the Republican Party. 70%. That means a lot of Republicans are worried about it too. Um, disagreement about whether voting is a right, 78% of Democrats think it is, but only 66% of Republicans think it is. Then you have gridlock and neglect of major policy problems. And what you have in many cases is the, the primacy of performative politics. Congressional, and uh, since I study congressional hearings these days, congressional hearings that aren't really about anything. <laughs> and congressional hearings where the lawmakers are acting like the 19th century when the members used to beat each other with their canes. <laughs> and um, legislation that's passed just to embarrass the other side so that you can run an ad in the next election. Could I have the last slide? So here we get, once again, the conversation gets too heated and the selection of a state muffin <laughs> is, um, uh, I can't read, actually read the bottom of it. Can you see what it says, Travis? 
No? Well, at any rate, this is, could be almost any legislative body in the United States these days. And they're so polarized and so angry with each other that they can't even pick the state muffin. <laughs> and lastly, you have the last slide. Very serious concerns that arose because of the insurrection that happened on January 6th, and, um, and which is being threatened. You had in the Supreme Court yesterday in the argument about whether Trump should appear on the ballot or not, with Supreme Court justices worrying and asking whether there was going to be bedlam if they denied Trump access to the ballot. In open court, and this is why. So, um, and Travis, I think what you can do now is take the camera off the screen because I don't have any more slides. Okay, so, well, not everything is bad. There's actually, if you look for it, there's quite a lot of agreement. Large majorities in this country think the United States is still the greatest country in the world. So on the one hand, we are saying, we're telling posters, everything's going to hell. And then we're saying, oh, yeah, we're the greatest country in the world. So it makes you really wonder, it makes me wonder anyway, about what people really are telling pollsters. Why would you respond that way if you really thought democracy was a failure and, um, and both of the candidates who are likely to be on the presidential ballot are dangerous to the nation and the people in the opposing party are out to destroy the country and so forth. So, so people, large majorities think we're still the greatest country in the world. Large majorities agree on big problems. Everybody agreed that inflation was bad. Everybody agreed about health care affordability. Everybody agreed the Dems and Reps need to work together. Everybody agreed the drug addiction was a serious problem, public health uh, problem. Large majorities agree that gun violence particularly gun violence that's taking the lives of our children, is a problem. Large, pe large groups of people believe that violent crime is a problem. And then there's immigration, where I would say Democrats have been, were slow to come around to recognize that this was a problem, and it's partly because they got burned when Obama was president, and where he tried to negotiate, and then the Republicans pulled the rug out from him, and then they lost control of Congress. So, at any rate, but nevertheless, these are big things, and they're things where the country would, behind, would be behind a bipartisan solution. That's what the country wants, and maybe that's why they're saying things are going to hell, because they certainly don't see that in Washington, or. Actually, when it has happened, the people, the minority of people who don't like it are just louder than the rest of us. And so it kind of perpetuates this idea of polarization. S large majorities oppose government shutdowns. Large majorities support gun control and abortion rights. Large majorities don't think m Medicare should be cut or that Social Security or veterans should have their benefits trimmed. 67% believe it is very important for the president to unite the country. And 90% believe that the president should be honest. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> so, um, any rate, so the issue here is that Things, you know, on the face of it, Americans look like they're really in the middle of a hissy fit. On the other hand, there's plenty there that suggests that we could come together as a country. If we could get past the fact that we just don't trust the other guys. Because they have, as it turns out, a lot of the same concerns. So the question in my head is, when I look at this data, is why can't we get there? Why can't we overcome the mistrust in, that's preventing us from uniting? We're not going to solve all these things, 
you know, a lot of Congresses have been working on immigration really since W in 2005 and um, so forth. So here's the, here are the explanations that you see in the press. It's the news media's fault. <laughs> well, it's always easy to blame them, poor suckers. Um, and there is a lot to blame because they insist on treating our politics as if it's a horse race and that the only important thing is who's ahead and who's behind and how, by how much. Um, and everything is treated, looked at through the lens of who, its effect on who's going to win the presidential election. You know, you see the headlines on the op-ed pages. And by the way, compared to when we were growing up, look at how much of the paper is opinion now compared to news. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. So, but when you look back historically on the news media, what do you see? The press in the 19th century was scurrilous. They said awful things. The press in the 19th century was also highly partisan. The one party put out its paper, the other party put out, put out their paper. There was no objective source of news. And yet, the country managed to not fall apart, after, even after having had this horrible civil war. So I think it's too easy for Americans to just say, oh, if we had a different media, things would be better. I just don't believe that. In many ways, the media is reflecting our own limitations. If we weren't so gullible, if we weren't so eager to believe the worst of the other side, they wouldn't print it because they wouldn't make money on it. But what the more candid journalists are now saying is, they really hope Trump wins the election because he sells cable subscriptions. <laughs> if they're being honest, because the controversy, the chaos around him, gets more people to tune into not just Fox News, but uh, CNN and MSNBC. Because then the people at M MSNBC can peddle their outrage at what's being said on Fox News. So I'm not saying the media isn't a problem, but I don't think we can play, put the blame for what we're seeing, this puzzle of the country's in pretty good shape, but nobody thinks it is. Um, so. The role of money, particularly dark money, in elections. Um, Citizens United, that Supreme Court case, really unleashed a huge deluge of cash. And basically, um, wealthy people are supporting keeping candidates in the, in the races. Um, and what's very interesting in this race, though, is the big money donors are not backing Trump. Maybe they'll come back. But, so you can't really blame, if you don't like Trump, you can't blame Trump on dark money. You can blame a lot of the mess in Congress on campaign finance, but there's a worse problem behind that, as I'll talk, say in a minute. You have residential sorting by income, race, and party preference, which leads to safe seats and a lack of electoral accountability. And this is a paper that I'm right, working on right now with regard to congressional district with a really smart scholar named Chris Fowler, um, who's a professor of geography at Penn State. <laughs> any rate, um, and we've been doing work on whether you can draw fair districts. And the answer is you can't because of residential sorting. And the more populations are sorting with a homogeneous group, the easier it is to gerrymandering. And in fact, to get fair districts, fair being defined as proportional, that the party that gets the most seats is also the one that gets the most votes. And basically, that doesn't happen in a lot of places, and it doesn't happen nationally. So, um, so what that means is, you know, you have about 20% of House seats being uncontested. You have, in this coming election, the latest tally is uh, in terms of the number of seats that are toss up. Out of 435, 18. So how can the public register, register its disapproval in the conventional way, which is throwing the bums out of Congress? I mean, that's how we always did it. 
and you'd have these huge swings of 50, 60 seats. And that's just not possible now. Um, I think primaries are a big problem. Primaries were a reform conceived in hell by the progressives. Um, and basically, the idea was to make the selection of candidates more democratic, to trim the power of the political parties. But primaries are one of the most fundamentally undemocratic features of our politics now. Why? Because that's where the money goes. And, it's, um, and turnout is very low. So my poor state of New Hampshire, which has wonderful turnout, we just vote because we got trained to that because of all the interest in the New Hampshire primary. Now the first in the nation for the Democrats is South Carolina. What do you think the turnout is in South Carolina? About 12%. What is it in New Hampshire? 51%. Who likes, a, who likes 12%? Interest groups and extremists. And they are the ones that show up for primaries. So primaries is, what, number one on my list, if I were a benevolent dictator, I would go back to smoke-filled rooms in a heartbeat. <laughs> the other thing, and this is something that a good friend of mine has worked on for a long time, because the parties are just so closely divided now, um, at the presidential level, for the Senate, for the House of Representatives, what they end up doing is magnifying their differences and exaggerating how bad the other side is because a couple of votes, a couple of seats, one way or the other, determines who's going to control the government. So they are complicit in trying to make themselves look good in tearing down the other side. And in the process, they're driving out reasonable people in the House and the Senate. We're getting very close to the fact that the crazy people will have a quorum. Um, the failure of Congress, since Congress is my field and I worked on Congress, it invites power grabs by the Supreme Court and the President because it can't function. If you look at the Constitution, Article One is the Congress. It's not the presidency and it's truly not the court. All of the ordinances when the new capital were set up to elevate the power of Congress in a democratic society. It's up on a hill. Where's the White House? Down in a swamp. <laughs> you couldn't even get between Capitol Hill and Congress when the Capitol was first set without going through that swamp. All of the height reg regulations in DC even today, you can't build a building that's higher than the Capitol Dome. And if you look of the powers of the national government, they're not in Article Two. They're in Article I. And what has happened over time as the country, you know, confronts big problems and the kind of veto points that exist in the Congress because of the Senate, people turn more and more to the presidency. But the power of the presidency is basically the power that Congress has given it over the last six, 70 years. And so when the Congress doesn't work, this whole elaborate system of separation of powers and checks and balances is completely out of whack. So the fundamental way in which our Constitution has structured our government is been upset both by the gridlock in Congress, which causes people to turn to the courts and the presidency, and also the fact that Congress repeatedly says, oh, that's a problem, we can't fix it. Um, I mean, the Republicans in Congress petitioned Joe Biden to, to do something about the border. <laughs> and he, as a former senator, said, wait a minute, that's your job. You tell me what I'm supposed to do. Oh, no. So, um, and finally, you have the decline of norms of comedy, respect, and truth-telling. When you look at, you know, people used to say about Lyndon Johnson, how do you know when he's lying? When his lips start moving. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, 
we don't even notice now when we're being lied to. It's just what people seem to expect. So, okay, so here we are. What does Tocqueville tell us about any of these things? He was an aristocrat who came to this country in, the, in 1830. He was a small d Democrat despite his aristocratic upbringing and he was eager to figure out why the French Revolution failed so dismally. And he went to the United States because that's where democracy, particularly at that time, was the only place where democracy was not just surviving but thriving. And you read his whole book and he, has, it's, he starts with town meetings in New England and all of these other things. He worries a lot about race and about the divisive nature of slavery and what it's going to do to tear our country apart. So he got that right. Um, and you just look at the things that he writes about and you say, wow, <laughs> he was 26 years old. He was really a very observant young man. But the main thing that he said was, what's unique to the United States is this self-interest rightly understood and the power, the art of association. So he starts with the idea that the real problem in any democracy is equality. If everybody's equal, everybody's equally powerless. You just have one vote. And so if you want to get anything done, you've got to figure out how to work with other people. You can't go to a baron and say, we need a new road. You can't go to the church and say, we need to do something about the poor. You have to figure out. And he talks a lot about how when Americans want to, the one thing that he really lo he loves is men who want to give up drinking. Remember, temperance was big in the 1830s. The men who want to give up drinking, they don't just say, I'm giving up drinking. They form an association. <laughs> so they all can give up drinking. And he remarks on this throughout the book. But his point is, that the powerlessness that comes from equality, if people can't get things done, they're going to turn to an autocrat. And so he sees the powerlessness that is inevitable in an egalitarian society also sets it up for embracing autocracy. And of course, that's what the French did. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is individualism. Well, we take that as a hallmark of our culture, right? He made up that word. And he noticed, he said, okay, another thing that comes from equality is that people think of themselves, whatever success they have had in their lives is the result of their own efforts. And he says, they have no sense of who came before and the people that they owe who preceded them and they have very little concern for the future. They are individuals, and they have very narrow circle, probably extending no farther than family and perhaps intimate, intimate friends. And he says in, in America, the weakness, the vulnerability, is that Americans will end up, quote, locked up in the isolation of their own hearts. Think about that for a minute locked up in the isolation of their own hearts. And that, of course, will mean Americans could never undertake any great undertaking. They're all too individualistic, and they don't think they owe anybody anything. We see a lot of that rhetoric today, don't we? But this, he says, that's the problem, but Americans have fixed that by embracing this principle of self-interest rightly understood, that I actually can't have what I want unless I work for the well-being of other people. Because no autocrat, no noble, no baron is going to give this to me. So I have to understand that my welfare is tied to the welfare of others. Okay, those are both pretty powerful ideas, aren't they? And I think they are at the root of what we're dealing with now. Because if you look, say, at the principle of self-interest rightly understood, you see all this talk about rights on both the left and the right versus obligations. Everybody's got rights. 
Nobody's got obligations. That's the first thing. And you see the changes in social institutions that teach cooperation. Now, whatever you think about the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts or the YMCA or churches or whatever, those are places where children, and they became very popular at the turn of the 19th century because the country was trying to integrate a huge number of immigrants. And so this is where the children of the new immigrants were taught self-interest rightly understood. And you have to look at the history of those organizations and how critical they were to handing on that cultural norm that first develops in the New England town meeting and so forth. Um, and so when we look, and now when schools are trying to teach tolerance and cooperation, they're being attacked because they're brainwashing um, to innocent children. And that really only the parents can say what is good for children. The idea that we might be raising our children with some idea of self-interest rightly understood is now viewed as indoctrination. So the, that's what's happened to that principle. There still are those things, and I see a lot in my Dartmouth students, of this understanding of how privileged they are and the obligation that comes with that. But you see a lot of the other two. These are my rights, this is what I'm owed. The heck with everybody else. The art of association, this has also changed. Interest groups have exploded into checkbook organizations. You could, we, you know, interest group world is alive and well. Everybody sends a check so that somebody is writing, you know, pursuing their particular agenda, many of which are hardly in the interest of the society as a whole. And the civic groups where you came together and you actually had to deal with people who were not like you and who might not think the way you do. The Elks Club, the Chamber of Commerce, the whatever, I wrote a bunch of these down. Um, the Lions, the Scouts. The only place, real place, where Americans are coming together is through sports. Particularly, that's where children learn sports. But what are we seeing on the playing fields of America? The parents are horrible. <laughs> and they're teaching their kids win at any price. And if the coaches try to teach values of sportsmanship and community, they're criticized because they, um, they're, they're not winning enough. So athletics is a huge way that we socialize children into um, the art of association. Labor unions. That was a place where people went and got political information. It's costly to get political information. If you're a working person, if you have two jobs, you've got kids at home, your wife's working, whatever, the labor union would give you political cues and information. And you would talk about it with your fellow union members. No, we shouldn't back this person. Or yes, we should. Um, so the decline of labor unions is a big, big part of this problem, believe it or not. Um, the suburbs. Coming to South Burlington, where is the center of South Burlington? Can anybody tell me? Huh? Market Street. Market Street. Okay, but that's true, and we're uh, we're lucky. We live in states that still have towns that have centers, and greens, and still have town meeting and so forth. But most of the world, most of the United States, lives in places where there are no centers, and there's no open space for people to gather. You can't even have, the kids can't even have a pickup game of softball, where they learn how to work out their differences without overbearing adults <laughs> telling them what to do. Um, hollowing out of the industrial cities is well established, but also the hollowing out of rural communities. The disappearance of small manufacturing companies it's been devastating. The disappearance of family farms in place of huge agribusinesses has been devastating. What's left are these husks, and what happens in these husks? People are on fentanyl. 
They're beating their wives. Their kids are running wild and have no hope of a future. So how can they embrace the art of association when there's nothing to associate into? So, and then of course, TV and cell, cell phones, but particularly cell phones. 10 years ago on the Dartmouth campus, when I would go from class to class or go downtown, I would see students, we would make out, uh, how, how are you, Professor Fowler, whatever. Now, they're all like this. So, so that's my diagnosis, that the thing, the two things that Tocqueville put his finger on as what distinguished our democracy from failed democracies were those two fundamental principles. So, let me stop here. And I have some questions for you, but you may have questions. And I think Cindy said there were going to be mics coming around. Um, while we get that done, one of the things I thought some of you, as I've been talking, may have come up with your own examples of things that you see as particularly problematic for American democracy. And you don't get to use those five-letter words. <laughs> yeah. Would you stand up and speak loudly, and then I'll repeat your comment. Yeah, it is. Here, let me see if I can help. I've got a green light. That's what you want. OK. A green light. <laughs> Thank you. I sometimes wonder how much of the problem, how much of the problem is we have too many people. If we were a smaller country, we would care more for each other and be nicer to each other. Well, that's certainly what the anti-federalists thought. Her question is, if we were a smaller country and had fewer people, um, would we be more caring towards each other? And when the Constitution was being ratified, the anti-federalists who lost that debate basically said, the country is too big to be a democracy. And you know, the only time democracy has really worked has been in small city states, like Athens or even Venice, um, small republics. And so they basically said, we have, we have to have a federation. We can't have a strong national government because it's not going to work. It'll be, it, you know, it won't be close enough to the people and so forth. But what Man James Madison says in Federalist 10, he turns that argument on its head. And he says, what makes us strong is our size and our diversity. And the argument is, if we're so big, it's going to be really hard for any one faction or cabal to seize power and control the whole government, particularly if we divide power. And so you see this that the states, so the Republican states are fighting Biden because they think what he's doing is wrong. When Trump was president, it was the Democratic states. Their attorneys general were suing and so forth. So the idea is if it's big enough and diverse enough, it's going to be really hard to find a single thing that will be a enable a faction to oppress the rest of the country. And in, in the end, that view carried the day, we did ratify the concept, but the anti-federalist idea is still very much alive. And um, the problem is, we are big. And we could start, we could do what um, Yugoslavia did and create three separate independent entities. I don't see a lot of support for that in the country. I have to say on my bad days when Texas threatens to secede, <laughs> I say, have a good life. <laughs> um, there's a question over there. OK, I'm coming. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good afternoon. Um, I see four things that to me are some of the most basic in terms of maybe turning us around. And of course that would require a constitutional convention which is also dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I'll, I'll name them real fast. The first one is money and politics. Mm -hmm. 
when you hear that uh, senators and congressmen and maybe even state senators and state congressmen are spending more time raising money mm -hmm. than they are helping their constituents and serving in Congress like they're supposed to, that's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so campaign finance reform would right. be my first one. Second one and that would- That could be done with a constitutional amendment without a convention. Okay, thank you. We'll I mean, do that. have to overturn citizens We'll do that. <laughs> okay. Second one is gerrymandering, and you mentioned that one. Mm -hmm. um, and it is now no longer racial gerrymandering, it's partisan gerrymandering, right. mm -hmm. and that is a problem. Uh, I don't know how we solve it, but certainly the fact- I do. Okay. <laughs> Tell Multi-member districts, larger what? districts, which um, encompass more diversity and make it harder. It what, what these larger multi-member districts would do would mean you'd, you'd have a much higher probability that there would be multiple coalitions in the district instead of its being dominated okay. by Okay, and Vermont the has, at the state level, yes. has had some multi-member right. districts, yes. And Congress passed a law in 67 to uh, outlaw multi-member districts, so that law would have to be changed. And they, they also limited the number of congressmen, too, to right. 435. Yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, and then okay, that, that three. okay, number three is uh, the electoral college, which many people bring up. Uh -huh. uh, we should have direct voting. And number four. Well, let me deal with oh, that one. Okay. There is legislation that's passed in many, many states now that where the state pledges to give its electoral college votes to the candidate that wins the most votes nationally. It uh -huh. started in Maryland and a number of states, there are about 70 electoral college votes shy of making that public policy. Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay. So, and we then so we don't need convention. Yeah. <laughs> What's the fourth okay. one? Okay, the fourth one is a, a required course in civics. <laughs> when, when, when I hear that, and I believe this too, that uh, immigrants gaining citizenship, which mm -hmm. they have to go through several lengthy yes. courses, mm -hmm. learning about it, how our government works. They know more yes. about how our government works yeah. and who's president and who the representative is, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. than, than you know, the average uh, A large Joe majority Schmoe. of Americans could not pass that test. Right. I rest my case. All righty. <laughs> Well, somebody likes that idea. I don't, couldn't tell how people were reacting to your others. But, but the point is, these are reforms that are not impossible. They don't require the constitutional convention. Um, and the reason why you worry about constitutional conventions is, so when the framers went to Philadelphia, they were gonna tweak the articles of convention and what did they do? They threw them all out and wrote a whole new thing where they invented federalism, presidencies, um, judicial review, a whole bunch of things that had never been tried before in the country. So God knows what people would invent now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I'd, I'd love your comment about another five letter, uh. not really a word, but an acronym that has had a pretty negative effect on rural America and small cities and small companies, and that's NAFTA. Yes. This is a case where NAFTA, the um, trade agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States, this was an era where the Democratic Party re embraced open markets and global trade. And um, except for Joe Biden, by the way, he, he rejected the open borders thing. And so, and, and the idea, and I have a dear friend, a colleague at Dartmouth, who is an expert on trade, and he will tell you that in the aggregate, free trade makes a society better off. That prices are cheaper, we have access to more kinds of goods, there's more quality and whatever, and I say to him, yes, but economists always never overlook the fairness of the distribution. So what we didn't do, and we still haven't done, is compensate the losers. We have some trade laws that provide very modest dollars for retraining, 
mostly, and, and, what, and I've heard Doug say this, well, if people can't get a job in uh, Bangor, Maine, then they need to move. It's a very cold-hearted view of the world, in my view. Oh, you can't have a decent life unless you move. And also what that means is our cities get more and more crowded and more and more unmanageable. So some of what's happening now with this reindustrialization that's going on is trying to create incentives, certainly by creating the infrastructure, so that modern companies can operate on the web, you know, with web and remotely and whatever. But I, you know, Clinton, Clinton missed the boat then, and I and Democrats have not been have not stepped up. Republicans are fine with it, seemingly. You know, it's let the market rule, but Democrats should have known better, in the view of some people. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Okay, I'm concerned about that because whether we like it or not, this is not the only country in the world and on the planet. And we have managed to use a four-letter word, South America and a lot of other countries mm -hmm. because we want bigger wages and more free goods. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to pay a, a fair wage to the people that are working their mm -hmm. bodies to pieces. Mm -hmm. And now we're pissed off because they want to come here and take advantage of what <laughs> we took. So I think we have, have to have yeah. a little more nuanced conversation about what really are the effects right. of free trade and what that really should mean and the self-interest. Yeah, rightly uh, understood. Rightly understood includes people other than us in the United States. I think we're really seeing story. that self-interest rightly understood involves the globe. Because, you know, if one country is polluting or dumping or killing all the whales or whatever, the rest of us pay the price for that. But going, but to latch on to what you first said, um, again, my economist friends would say, world poverty measured in the aggregate has decreased significantly. But again, the problem is distributional. And they would say that without all those um, sweatshops in places like Peru and whatever, Peru would be even poorer and more desperate. Yeah, I'm just saying that. Rightly understood in a broader in a broader sense, but that sort of there isn't consensus in this in in this country about what free trade really is about. Um, it's not just about the aggregate productivity of the society. Some people think distribution internally in a nation and cross nations are things that we should be thinking about. And pretty soon, Mother Nature is gonna, gonna take care of it. One last question over here. Yeah, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, so my question is about, well, it's a quite, quite question part observation. So question, term limits. How do you think term limits um, or the lack of term limits has impacted what we're seeing now in our government structure in Congress? Oh, I, if you want me to say term limits, it would be good you got the wrong person. Because I actually testified before the House Judiciary Committee back in Oh, I didn't want you to say no, any. No, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. But, um, and I used James Madison. Mm -hmm. um, what a lot of the problems that we have in government right now are the result of amateurism in politics. Mm -hmm. People have decided that outsiders are a good thing in a society. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't go to a heart surgeon who just figured it out yesterday. Well, it turns out that Madison and Hamilton particularly worried a lot about competence in government. And they, 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 and, the, and continuity. And what Madison said, it's a democracy not just ours, but it needs what he called masters of the public business. And a master of the public business was somebody who'd held office, not just nationally, but locally, so knew how, and, it, and had served long enough to know that other people have needs because the Congress was supposed to be a place for deliberation. He says in Federalist 10, that's where you refine and enlarge the pub public view. I don't see a lot of refining and enlarging going on in our Congress right now. 
And, what, and the reason for that is that so many people are being elected, particularly in the Republican Party, I have to say, because they don't know anything <laughs> about politics. And so they can't get what they want because they don't know how to work the system. And all they can do is say, no, we don't want that. And they've put poor Johnson in the hot seat now. He doesn't have a clue what's going on. And, and we shouldn't expect him. How does, he's never been in a leadership role in the Congress, and suddenly he's the speaker. He's never even chaired a committee. Oh my God. Um, and so if you're going to be an effective speaker of the House, you have to know your members. You have to know what they want. You have to know how much pressure they tolerate, what they, you know, what their priorities are for their districts, and so forth. Now, to some extent, when you have these clueless members being elected, they don't know what their districts want because they ran on chaos, and you know, and and uh, own the libs, and so Johnson can't even figure out how to round them up. It's no accident that um, Jeff, you know, that the Democratic minority leader is able to keep his members in line. He's had a lot of experience. So did Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. She was able to, they both are able to head off problems at the pass. Now you might not like the fact that they are, are so successful, but if you want, if you want to get what you want politically, you better stop picking amateurs. Wow, this has been terrific. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> <laughs>